Welcome to Lakehead University's Treaties Recognition Week. Panel discussion, Robinson Huron Treaty 1850 Annuities Case. We are happy that you are able to join us. Denise Baxter, Makwadotam, Martin Falls and Donjaba. My name is Denise Baxter, Vice Provost Indigenous Initiatives at Lakehead University, and I will be your MC for the event today. Lakehead University respectfully acknowledges its campuses are located on the traditional lands of Fort William First Nation, signature to the Robinson Spear Treaty of 1850, and the Ojibwe, Ojibwe Odawa, and Potawatomi Nations, collectively known as the Three, Fighter, Three Fires Confederacy in the area of the Williams Treaty. In Lakehead's commitment to social justice and social responsibility, we advance the Truth and Reconciliation Commission Calls to Action and the University's Canada Principles on Indigenous Education. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission recommendation to build capacity for intercultural understanding, empathy, and mutual respect has become a guiding principle for the commitments like it has made in both Northwestern Ontario and Simcoe County, and will continue to guide our efforts in the future. Before we begin, I would like to share an important notice of video recording of the Treaties Recognition Week event. Participants are reminded that this online event is being recorded. And we are doing this to preserve a record in the university's archives and to publicize and promote Lakehead University. By attending, you are agreeing to be including in the recording and its public dissemination in any media now known or later developed anywhere in the world in perpetuity. Uh, we anticipate we'll have this recording up at lakeheadu.ca forward slash indigenous on our YouTube channel by the end of the week. So you can come back to it again. It is now my pleasure to introduce the panel moderator for today's uh, session. Professor Tanael Brown is an assistant professor at the Boralaskan Faculty of Law at Lakehead University, where she teaches in the, eels, in the areas of property law, wills and estates, and Aboriginal legal issues. Her research examines the intersection between land, property, and geography with a focus on human rights. Professor Brown is a member of the Human Rights Research and Education Center and a member of the Center for Law, Technology, and Society, housed both at the University of Ottawa. Professor Brown is a barrister and solicitor at the Bar of Ontario. And prior to her academic work, Tanil worked in the Kingdom of Eswatini, formerly known as the Kingdom of Swaziland, as a legal officer in a national femi feminist rights organization. She publishes in the area of property law, Aboriginal law, and technology. And her recent publication reflects on these in the context of Etstawani. See Tanil Brown, Locating the Woman, A Note on Customary Law and the Utility, utility of Real Property in the Kingdom of Eswatini, published in Angela Cameron, Sari Gabrin, and Val Napoleon, Creating Indigenous Property, Power, Rights, and Relationships with the University of Toronto Press. This was just a recent publication last year in 2020. I'd like to welcome Tanil Brown. And uh, it is really our pleasure to uh, have you join us today. And I look forward to listening to the panel as it's moderated. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Denise. That was wonderful. I am thrilled to be here. Um, the discussion today is going to be led by three incredibly knowledgeable people involved in the restore and litigation, which is so important to our work here at Lakehead um, and to the lands that we are situated on. Um, so I'm going to introduce our three uh, panelists. Um, we had their bios just a moment ago on the slideshow and there's so much information there. So let me uh, get going. Um, firstly, we have uh, Chief Dean Sayers. Uh, Dean uh, Sayers has been Chief of Batchewana since 2005 and he's now serving his eighth two, uh, his eighth two-year term. During this time the Batchewana First Nation has seen astronomical growth. Chief Dean Sayers grew up in Batchewana village, a small community approximately 50 miles north of Sault Ste. Marie, where he worked with his father and brother in the First Nations commercial fishing industry. This experience provided education on the traditional understandings of the history of Batuana, its affiliation with Lake Superior, and the reserve jurisdiction of the area. Chief Sayers moved on in pursuit of higher education and work experience, spending 13 years in Southern Ontario in various human service roles with First Nations peoples. He then returned home to take on various leadership roles, including uh, the role as chief. 
It is through a culmination of experiences and understanding of Batuana's history, which led to chief sayers and various councils to the formulation of the community's letter of assertion, a document outlining Batuana's expected relationship with resource developers in the original lands set aside for Batuana's sole benefit and use as part of the Robertson-Huron Treaty of 1850. This uh, assertion has been instrumental to maintaining the First Nations sovereignty, jurisdiction, and contributes immensely to Batuana's success today. Chief Sayer's post-secondary education and more importantly, historical understandings of Batuana and its people have been instrumental to the First Nations success. Chief Sayers and the Batuana uh, First Nations had led the charge in demanding Indigenous peoples fair share of resource revenues. Resource developers are eager to work with the um, community in a wide array of resource extraction in initiatives, um, including data collection uh, through to renewable energy projects. Uh, secondly, we have uh, Micra Stool. Um, who is the chair of the Robertson Huron Treaty Trust. Um, uh, Mike Ristool is a citizen of Nipissing First Nation in Ontario, Canada. His Ojibwe name is Washuk uh, Muskrat. Um, he is Nipissing Ojibwe of the Anishinaabe Nation. His dodon, his clan, is the turtle. Mike's formal education was as a journeyman railway mechanic, um, and he studied, studied labor management relations with the Canadian Labor Congress. He's also studied political science and law and justice at Laurentian University in Sudbury, Ontario. Mike's early career was in the railway and telecommunications industry, where he worked as a journeyman and as an official with the railway in his later career. He also worked with the Anishinaabe Nation, concentrating in the negotiations of education and governance. Mike's volunteer interests include serving on the board of directors at the local Indigenous Friendship Centre and as a counsellor for 17 years in Nipissing First Nations Council. Today, he continues to serve the Indigenous community as the lead plaintiff in a treaty legal action against Canada and Ontario that is making its way through Ontario's court system. Um, and thirdly, we have uh, Chris Albanati. Uh, Chris Albanati is the primary junior lawyer on the Restool legal team and has been present in court throughout all stages of the Restool litigation, including the recent hearings before the Ontario Court of Appeal. Chris received his Juris Doctor from Thompson Rivers University um, in Canloops, BC, and articled with the Appeals Division of the Legal Ser Services Society of BC. Um, he is called to the bar of uh, BC and Ontario and joined Nawagabau Corbier as an associate. Um, as an associate. In 2017, Chris successfully defended his LLM thesis titled Indigenous Blockades and the Power to Speak the Law from Settler Colonialism to Indigenous Resurgence at Osgoode Law School and began working on a PhD dissertation on the assertion and performance of Indigenous laws and jurisdiction in the context of Indigenous land defenders. Chris practices solely in the area of Aboriginal law and primarily in treaty, Aboriginal title and rights litigation, where he advocates exclusively for First Nations clients. He has appeared at all levels of the court, including the Supreme Court of Canada, where he was co-counsel for the Indigenous Bar Association. Um, so as I said, uh, I'm thrilled to be welcome these three um, esteemed people um, to speak with us today and share information about the Restool decision. Um, I'd like to begin just by asking, um, uh, inviting uh, our three panelists to introduce um, um, themselves and explain um, their connection to the Restool um, decision. Why don't we go ahead with you, um, Chief uh, Sayers. Anin Bonjour Kenewea, Ogamanam and Agoji Weakasid. I'm uh, Chief Teen Sayers, and um, my name is He Stands and Walks Tall and um, Flies with Tilted Wing. And I'm from the Crane Clan. More particularly, I'm um, Blue Heron. And um, that's really significant in my neck of the woods. Um, 
this is where we understand creation have, has evolved from. And um, at one point in our history, uh, not long after we were lowered here, um, it was the crane that um, worked with us and helped us in um, choosing an area on behalf of the crater that we would look after. And that area is the eastern shore of Lake Superior at the heart of Turtle Island, the heart uh, of the Great Lakes. And uh, we've had responsibility at the center of that to uh, be able to make sure that that area around our, uh, our Mother Earth's heart is clean and looked after properly. And with that um, came a lot of instructions on how that was supposed to happen. So part of that instruction was never, um, well, all of that instruction was never uh, seated, was never succumbed, uh, was never a part of any surrender within the agreements that we made to the new people that arrived on our lands. We always maintain those promises to the creator and all of creation. So throughout this land, um, we've uh, not been shy about uh, not only asserting, but reclaiming a lot of those inherent jurisdictions that we inherited from the creator. And that has come uh, to light in many ways, including uh, being listed along with Mike as one of the plaintiffs with regards to the annuities. Uh, we've also challenged the illegal assertion of the Ontario government to manage forestry. Uh, we've also challenged the illegal assertion of jurisdiction that was exercised by the Ontario government around fisheries. And uh, on the most part, we've been successful. Even the, the assertion of lands that were stolen from us, um, a huge uh, provincial park about 60 miles long, about uh, 10 miles inland uh, that was stolen from us uh, in the 1940s. And that one is on its transition back to us under indigenous title not under the fake title that the Crown asserts. Um, and in, in particular, uh, we were really careful. We are the 15th band, the 15th group of people that signed off on the Robinson Huron Treaty. And we were 15th because we almost didn't sign it. We were really uncomfortable with the confines of the treaty. We had initially understood that it was only about copper and that's still our premise today. And uh, ended up, we ended up being number 15. We almost didn't sign it. We were not going to compromise our inheritance, our inherent jurisdictions. And that's still alive and well. Unfortunately, for a period of time through history, um, it was illegal for us to talk this way. I probably would have been arrested for saying these things today, just up till 1950 or so. So since 1950, now that it's legal for us to hire a lawyer, now that it's legal for us to challenge the Crown, now that it's legal for us to leave the community, now that it's legal for us to get educated, we're starting to open up and say, wow, what a gift we've been given by our historic leadership, our, our elders, our ancestors that somehow incorporated such beautiful inherent um, jurisdictions into what we see now as the robinson Huron Treaty. We do have concerns with the written document that you see because we didn't even speak English. We didn't even write, but somehow we've been able to maintain those inherent expectations throughout um, history. And even today, when you interpret the treaty from our lens, which is of legal force, um, you'll find that we are still probably the most powerful nation in Canada as far as our reserved inherent jurisdictions. And the key thing with the robinson Huron Treaty, if you really read it carefully or understand it carefully, is that if the treaty fails, there was never an absolute surrender of our jurisdiction. If this treaty fails, the land doesn't revert to the Crown, the land reverts back to us and that scares the crap out of the Crown. And you'll notice there's absolute surrenders afterwards in a number of treaties, but this one is the most powerful treaty that reserved so many jurisdictions for the indigenous people in this area. And all we have to do is say, treaty's done, we're negating the treaty, and guess what? It all reverts back to us. So unfortunately, we have to go to these great extents to see the true spirit and intent of the implementation expectations we have. 
And unfortunately, we had to go into the visitor's court, which is scary for us because we never gave jurisdiction to the visitors to operate a justice system, to operate a policing system, to operate a legal system. Those were all illegal assertions of the, of the parliamentary supremacy, I call it, that Canada assumed, which is illegal based on, I feel like taking this from the Indians today, so I'm going to do it. And I dare them to try and stop me and I'll kill them if they stop me. So we went through a lot of years of that kind of mentality. So where we are today is, uh, is a pretty wonderful, beautiful place. And uh, we can assert, and we don't have to be afraid of being arrested and thrown in jail for six months for this or six months for that. Like my dad, who just passed away, he would have been hundred this year. And he said all the way throughout his young, being young, he had heard from, and he was experiencing it. Well, no matter what happened in the, in the city, They'd, they'd be pick, picking them up six months in jail, six months in jail. Six, it was always, if you're hunting, you got caught hunting six months in jail. You got caught fishing six months in jail. Never a trial, never processes. If there was a murder, all the Indians did it. It was just, so now it's not like that. We have some, we've moved a little ways, not where we want to be, but we got a long ways to go yet. Unfortunately, the annuities, like who else around this world pays their landlord $4 a year? We're the landlord. Why is not the crown paying their rent? They promised to us. Why do we have to take them to court? That's ridiculous. And they fight us and fight us right to the end. Like, and I'm assuming that they're going to keep fighting us. But when I talk to Ontario citizens, Canadian citizens, they say, really? They didn't pay the rent. I came to Canada respecting and understanding this beautiful relationship that Canada has with Indigenous people and to find that they're crapping on Indigenous people and stealing from them and killing them and murdering them and taking away their freedoms and putting them on these concentration camps they call reserves and taking their kids on them and putting them in residential schools, killing their kids, hiding them, all illegal stuff. Canadians don't want that. That's what I'm hearing. They're telling the governments of Ontario and Canada, and there's a petition that's going to be served tomorrow, like, pay the rent, stop these appeals, stop fighting the Indians. Like, they're beautiful people. We need their insight. We need their wisdom for how we're going to look after the earth. I hope the Canadians will, will hear some of the stuff that we're going to talk about so that we can have a rightful relationship based on how we anticipated that through the prophecies that were shared with us historically. We will get into a better place. It is coming. Come hell or high water, we will get there. And uh, I'm going to be a part of that. And I'm going to push. And I'm going to be taking advantage of these opportunities to share with Canadians the true history, the reality of who we are. Not his story, somebody else's story that's that's uh, that's endorsed by the Crown, but our story. So thank you for this opportunity to be able to share today. And uh, thank you for an opportunity to provide a little segue. And uh, I'm honored to sit here with this elder, um, Mike, and uh, also our, our counsel here with uh, Chris. Uh, it's really wonderful to be in this company, along with all the people that are joining us on online. So miigwech. Miigwech, thank you for that um, opening statement, giving a broad overview of uh, um, so much uh, is related to this decision. I wonder if we can, I can invite you, Chris, uh, to introduce yourself and to explain your connection with the case. Um, but I think that we could just also move directly into um, learning about the Restool decision about the litigation, it'd be helpful if we could ask you to situate ourselves in the litigation. Um, tell us about the issues that are being litigated in the uh, Rastul, uh, Robertson, Superior, uh, Superior and Huron Treaty case, um, and perhaps a little bit about the procedure connected to um, that case. Thanks, Chris. Miigwech, Danilia. Mabitsia kao to Ansi, Chris Albanati. I'm speaking to you here from the Lekwungen uh, speaking peoples, uh, the territory of the Esquimalt and Songhees Nation here in Victoria, so-called British Columbia. Um, <clears throat> visiting here for a couple of weeks to get my head fully immersed in this case again as we prepare for stage three, which I'll talk about um, and outline for you. So of course, the Robinson Huron Treaty, uh, the Restool litigation, as it's being referred to, um, is about interpreting the proper or the proper interpretation of the Robinson Huron Treaty. Uh, it was trifurcated, as you sort of mentioned, into three stages. Um, so the first stage was about uh, treaty interpretation. So how do we interpret uh, treaty, the treaty itself? And in particular, uh, a provision in the treaty 
in the written text of the treaty, if you will, uh, that's called the augmentation clause. Um, and I, I won't sort of go into it because of time, but the augmentation clause essentially, uh, you know, says that as, uh, as uh, the productivity of the territory is, uh, is increased, um, the, uh, the annuity that is paid every year uh, will also be increased. Um, and then it has this sort of part of it that says, or such further sum as Her Majesty may be graciously pleased to order. Uh, but stage one was really about that. And, and in order to interpret a treaty under Canadian law um, in the Canadian courts, it requires uh, uh, a search, if you will, for common intention. It's the legal terminology for it. And so a common intention implies that there are two perspectives uh, that, you know, um, two mutual perspectives. Uh, where did they meet? Um, where, where are they? Uh, you know, what common ground is there between, on the one hand, the Anishinaabek nation and the British crown um, at the time of the treaty. And so it involves a lot of evidence uh, about those two perspectives to try to understand um, what was possible in terms of a common intention. And so as, as Gima Sayers was saying in his uh, overview, you know, there is his story or the Crown's story, um, their version of the events that took place, their version of, of their understanding of the treaty. And, and that's clearly captured in the written text of the treaty. But the Anishinaabek also have their own understanding of the treaty, their own history um, that they've kept and kept sacred, obviously, and, and kept, you know, throughout the 170 years since the time of the treaty, they've they've managed to ensure that it's it's remained um, in place and, and preserved uh, so that that history, the Anishinaabek understanding and history of the treaty is not uh, washed away um, or flooded by the rising tide of, of colonialism. And so in our opening statements, um, both at trial and in the Ontario Court of Appeal, we talked about uh, a sacred story, a sacred Anishinaabek story on Sukhanan, uh, about creation, about flood, and about the story of muskrat, or, or wajushk, which is the name, as you mentioned, of Mike Stool, who is our, our, one of our lead named plaintiffs. And the story of wajushk is about resurgence. It's about ensuring that those things that get flooded out, um, you can uh, reclaim them and resurge, and there's a resurgence there. And so those things are brought up to make the earth anew and to restore them. And so that's what really what we're dealing with in stage one is bringing all of these things to light, bringing the Shinabe worldview, bringing Shinabe laws, governance, um, language uh, to bear and before a court uh, so that they can properly understand the treaty and the common intention from both the Shinabe worldview and the crown worldview. Um, so that's the stage one is treaty interpretation. And uh, and if you've read the decision or had the chance to, you'll see that uh, our judge, Justice Patricia Hennessy, um, really took advantage of the opportunities that were there to immerse herself in the Anishinaabe worldview so that she could provide a, a, a good decision. And she found in our favor um, and, uh, and gave a great decision. I won't cover it. Um, stage two was about, and this happened in... Uh, October of 2019. So stage one was 2017 through 2018. Stage two, the trial took place in October of 2019, and that was about the Crown's defenses. So in stage one, once the judge determined that the Crown had a treaty obligation, a mandatory obligation, as she put it, to increase the annuity um, above $4 uh, as uh, in accordance with the productivity of the territory as the net Crown revenues were realized, then it became a matter of, um, does the Crown have any defenses to this obligation? And these are typically things that deal with time. So uh, the two issues there were sort of limitations, which is under a defense under statutes, uh, where you know there's a certain category of actions or causes of action, if you will, that can be barred because of time. It's just taking the plaintiffs too much time to bring their action to court. Uh, and the second one 
which is particular to the crown is called crown immunity. And this is a doctrine that uh, um, the crown can invoke to say that because it's the crown, it can be immune from certain actions. Uh, and so we had that fight as well in stage two um, and we were successful as well. Uh, and then uh, another part of the issue in stage two was crown liability. Um, but we, it was only sort of dealt with in a preliminary way and there wasn't really a determination flowing from that. Stage three is the, the big part of the trial that we're all preparing for right now. And it's scheduled to start in September of 2022. And stage three is really all the remaining issues that are have to be dealt with in this uh, litigation. Um, and so maybe what I should have prefaced is that for those who are lawyers or law students, is that stages one and two proceeded by way of summary judgment motions. And uh, those, are, those are usually when you have a trial or a case that is so huge and so complicated like this one, um, a summary judgment motion is a, is a procedure or a mechanism that can be used to sort of sever off different issues uh, and, and deal with them discreetly. Uh, because, you know, the issue of treaty interpretation is so huge and requires so much evidence. Uh, you know, it took us 78 court days to, to, uh, to do it, um, you know, and so you can, you can sort of help to uh, minimize the amount of time, the court time that is required and energy and time, money and resources and, and so forth. So, but stage three now where is we'll deal with all the remaining issues so far, we're dealing with, because we found that as in stage one, that the treaty does impose an obligation on the Crown to engage in a process um, and pay uh, increased annuities. Uh, stage two found that the Crown had no uh, legitimate defenses. And when I say the Crown, I should say that both Canada and Ontario are defendants in this action. So now there are Crowns. Um, but they have taken very different positions uh, as the case has evolved. So Ontario is the only one who has relied on defenses, whereas Canada in stage two did not. It withdrew any reliance on, on defenses that it had pled. Um, so now we're into stage three, and this will be about compensation for the failure of the Crown to have fulfilled its treaty, fiduciary and honorable obligations under the treaty. And then it will also deal with the question of Crown liability, um, who, is responsible, who is liable for certain aspects of the obligations that the Crown undertook in 1850. Um, and there are some other issues too, uh, which will play out certain things like boundaries, um, whether or not this will be an issue is something that's still up in the air. Uh, obviously the treaty territory is a geographic area um, and under Canadian law, there's this very, this. Um, you know, you might say they love to have lines. They love to draw clean lines around their properties. And so, um, and so they call those boundaries. And so boundaries are something that have to be considered. Uh, so we'll, we'll be getting into that in stage three, possibly. And, um, and yeah, and so there are other smaller issues, which I won't sort of outline for you, but that's, that's essentially an overview of the structure of the litigation the three stages. Um, I didn't really go into the treaty itself, but uh, you'll get that as we go through the questions, I think. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you for that overview um, of the matter. There has been um, some questions coming in, and so I didn't say at the beginning, um, please go ahead and post your questions. We should have uh, um, 15 minutes or so at the end to address some of them. And, and hopefully we also, you know, pick up some of these questions during the course of, of our conversation. So, Mike, welcome. Let's bring you in to the conversation yes. here. Um, and I just want to invite you to introduce yourself. Tell us about your um, your work um, as chair of the Treaty Trust. Um, and then a specific question in relation to that. So as chair of the Treaty Trust, uh, please tell us a little bit about that work, what it is that you do um, in relation to what we're calling the restore litigation. Um, but I'm interested in the ways in which um, the community has come together under what is um, a very big
court decision um, communities, the time involved, the work um, that has happened in your many years of involvement um, in this case. Um, what has the journey been like leading up to the restore decision? Thanks, Mike. Uh, bonjour, Ani. Bonjour, je suis le cause. Nous vivons ici, dans le Japon. <laughs> my Ojibwe name is Muskrat, and I live at Nipissing First Nation near North Bay, Ontario, and I'm from the Turtle Clan. I have, it is my pleasure and also my honor to be a plaintiff in this case. This is an old case that started a long, long time ago, as a matter of fact. In 1851, a year after the uh, treaty was signed in Baoting, uh, Chief Shingwa Kons, was one of the originators of the, of the treaty on behalf of the Ojibwe, said to Crown officials in 1851, you are not following, living up to the terms of the treaty that we signed. He said, I see development all over the place. I see mines opening up. I see people uh, in timber operations and uh, there are people moving into the territory and you haven't increased the annuity in accordance with the agreement that we signed in the treaty. And uh, that fell on deaf ears. And it continued after that for quite a, quite a number of years until in 1875, the, the, uh, the annuity was increased to $4 where it's stuck today. But my part in, in dealing with this started in the early 1990s. I began to work with the chiefs. I was a counselor on the uh, First Nation Council at Nipissing, and I was asked by the council to uh, represent Nipissing First Nation in those discussions with the chiefs about uh, the treaty. So I began to work with the chiefs from that point on, and I continued with that. A lot of people came and went. I stuck it out. I'm still here today. And I believe that it's my obligation to do that. I feel that after we've gone through a number of ceremonies, sweat lodge, pipe, lo uh, pipe ceremonies, uh, I've been given the task or the obligation to carry this along to conclusion. And it's my obligation to, to keep working on this until, until it's concluded. So that's why I'm still here after all, these, uh, after all this time. We started out with the 21 First Nations in some very erratic, meetings at the start I found and that the chiefs could not come to a consensus on how to approach uh, resolution of the uh, of the, the treaty annuities. Some of the chiefs wanted to con concentrate just on annuities, some of the chiefs wanted to concentrate on land, others wanted to concentrate on uh, on resources Others wanted to talk about harvesting rights and those kinds of things. So that's, and we finally agreed that that was too much of a, of a, a task to do in one court uh, venture. So the chiefs then agreed to simply mandate a committee, a group to, uh, to work on simply the annuities uh, augmentation as it is written in the treaty. So what happened then in order for us to, to uh, pull ourselves together as 21 First Nations, uh, we proposed to the, to the chiefs that we create a trust indenture. In other words, this trust indenture would knit all of the uh, 21 First Nations under a process with some guidelines and some, and some, and some rules of operation that we would bring this case forward into the court. Because what was happening before, because there are so many uh, elections happening from time to time over the years in First Nations, 
the players kept coming and going and coming and going. So with the trust indenture, the chiefs agreed that we would appoint trustees to, to, to deal with the case with a legal team. That trust indenture was established in 2010. I uh, can't remember, the, I, I believe it was October of 2010. October seems to be the month <laughs> where things happen. <laughs> anyway, it was in October of 2021 and we signed that uh, trust indenture at uh, Whitefish River First Nation. Uh, and uh, our job was started from that point. We were uh, in, entrusted with the, with the lead roles in that trust. Myself as the chair, uh, Ogema Duke Pelche from Wikwemakong is the vice chair, or the secretary treasurer rather. Peter Rekola from Wanapate First Nation is the vice chair of the, of the trust. And along with uh, the others, Chief Dean Sayers from Batchwana, Chief Patsy Corbier from Ondek Omnikoning, and Angus Toulouse, who is from Sagamok Anishinaabek First Nation. We are the six people under what we refer to as the Litigation Management Committee. Our mandate is to work closely with the, with the legal team to, uh, to bring the case through the court system. And uh, the, uh, the legal team would uh, advise us and recommend to us uh, uh, means of action to bring the case forward. And uh, we've stuck it out all these years and we're not, uh, we're not quite finished yet, but I think we're, we're very closely on the road to, to success in our, uh, in our venture. And I am deeply honored and it is my pleasure to be the chair of the uh, trust. Miigwech. Uh, my understanding um, is that that trust work is quite unique um, work. So even creating that as a procedural component of this um, case is remarkable and a huge amount of work. Um, so thank you for that. The uh, the trust is a is a is it? Um, I guess it's it, it's an institution created simply by the uh, sovereignty of the 21 First Nations. In other words, they took their own authority to put together this uh, trust indenture. And it is not uh, governed by Ontario law. It is not governed by on, uh, uh, federal law. It is only governed by uh, First Nation law. And that I think is unique and is very important for us to bring our case. Thank you. So where um, you sort of raise the next uh, um, questions or comments around uh, um, that I wanted to touch upon and bring out around indigenous law, right? And so we have this uh, um, three stages, this remarkable sort of approach uh, from Justice Hennessy. Um, and there was uh, throughout proceedings um, the use of Anishinaabe legal and treaty procedure within the Superior Courts. Um, so I wanted to turn it over back to you, um, Chief, um, to maybe speak to that a little bit. What were the legal and cultural um, traditions that were brought into the courtroom? What were the Indigenous laws? What is the significance here of adopting Anishinaabe procedure um, and what that means for the reaffirmation of treaty obligations? You're on um, mute. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, so all the way through from the uh, Anishinaabe, from us, um, we're continually reminded of our ancestors and we have a really close relationship with our ancestors. Uh, sometimes uh, in our daily work in our villages, um, we'll have a lot of ceremonies 
and ceremonies will help us reconnect. And if we need clarity, we'll ask pipe carriers to smoke some SEMA or tobacco, and we'll ask them to maybe find some guidance for us from the ancestors, and they'll tell us what the ancestors are communicating. Um, similarly, in the sweat lodges, we ask the grandfathers and the grandmothers to come in there and ask uh, and listen to our petitions and provide us again with guidance in what we do. Um, whenever we ask uh, help from our ancestors, uh, we, we recognize that they're making effort to join us and be a part of us in this world. And that takes effort on their part. So when we do that, we feed them, we give them a drink of water. Um, we, we are a very ceremonial, spiritual people still today. We are still close to that relationship with the spirit world. We've only been accustomed to um, this foreign concept of how society functions today for a very short number of years. We've only been affected by colonization for a few hundred years. And that's only a blink of an eye in our history as a people that have accepted the responsibility of looking after these lands and all of our relatives on these lands. So it's not just something new that we're incorporating in, in, into the legal uh, process that we're embarked on. We've asked for intervention from our ancestors and how we can uh, eventually see the proper uh, rep implementation of the Wawendimagiwin is what we call it, our promises. Because in our languages, there's no, there's no word for treaty, but we know that we've always made promises to each other and we make promises. We don't make those promises on a piece of paper and stamp it and sign it. Our promises are made in witness of all creation. Everything, everybody is involved and witnesses all the trees, all the animals, all the plants, the water, um, the even the minerals are a spirit. They all listen and hope that we're going to continue to protect them and make a small footprint and do things in a sustainable way. And so we always are conscious of that. We wanted to be able to bring that into this foreign concept. And it was really difficult for a lot of the chiefs, a lot of the elders to enter into a conflictuous uh, process that's rooted in Her Majesty's Law. If, um, if, you, if you looked at a courtroom and the people that are in high regard that make decisions are not sworn to our side of the treaty. They're sworn to their majesty's law. Even our lawyers, to a large degree, have to recognize that if they want to maintain their role or their position in the, what I think it's called the bar, in that process. We, as a people, remember that we are a nation and the crown represented by Britain were also recognized as a nation. And Canada inherited as the administrator the obligations of the crown. They are not a treaty partner. They have only inherited that. So we really with trepidation looked at going into a Canadian court, a lesser court than an international court that should be overseeing a resolution. We have our own language, our own law, our own land, our own people, our own spirituality, much like Britain has theirs. And it's from that premise that we entered into these sacred agreements, these promises to each other. And it was really uh, uncomfortable for us because the lawyers in, in that Canadian court swear allegiance to Her Majesty, the judge swears allegiance to Her Majesty, the Crown attorneys, the everybody they don't swear allegiance to our side, our law. So how are we going to get a fair shake there? And our lawyers uh, and our, our, our elders said, we have to trust that we're going to be able to find what we need. We have to bring what we can to help us in those contemplations and those decisions. Having our spirituality close by, having a sacred fire burning outside of that institution, the, the federal, uh, the provincial, uh, whatever, the, the settler's court systems having our ancestors join us through pipe ceremonies, through sweat lodges, invite everybody that's involved to come in, participate in our ceremonies and feel the medicine, feel the spirituality, feel 
the uh, the ancestors in the work that was going to happen on behalf of everybody that was joining us on our lands and how we were going to revisit the original expectations of how we were supposed to live side by side. It was scary. And what I what I always make sure that I, I explain to when I delve into the foreign courts is that we will give it a chance. We'll give it a chance to get justice. But it's really a risk. We always maintain and we always make sure that in our back pocket that we say, we'll give your system a chance to provide a serving of justice. However, if that system doesn't provide that, we still have our reserved unextinguished jurisdiction to make those similar contemplations in our own systems. So we will continue to pursue the original spiritual the original beautiful relationship that we foreseen with how we were gonna share that was prophesied even before the coming of the new people to our lands. We will continue to work towards that vision coming to fruition. And it's gonna it's gonna happen somehow that all of those reserved jurisdictions and expectations we have in the treaty will see the light of day. And um, we'll do that through the cooperation of the foreign court or the Canadian or provincial court or alternatively through our own court system or an international mechanism. The, we've got a lot of things that we can be doing, but I think what we're, we're talking about is the incorporation and the embracing of an indigenous perspective so that we can get the full picture when we enter into the, the settlers courts. So we embraced it, we embraced this opportunity and it was really nice that we had every party that was um, involved in the litigation, even the legal representatives join us in a sweat lodge in Thunder Bay. And um, what an incredible experience. We had some challenges though, because um, we weren't, the, the municipality uh, wasn't gonna allow us to have a fire, which is integral, it's centripetal to our people. Uh, it, it got kind of heated and I think um, Chief um, Thunder Bay, uh, Fort William, uh, Peter Collins for helping out, intervening, uh, and saying like, "We're having the fire. It's not a negotiable. This is our inherent right. This is. It's not going to be determined by a settler government and get a permit. From, we should be issuing those permits. We never gave up our jurisdiction over fire. So it was a little rocky, but we ended up having a fire burning outside of the Thunder Bay uh, facilities, the Thunder Bay courthouse for four days in the park and the throngs of our people that came, hundreds of people that came that were looking for culture from our people that were living on the streets, that were wanting help. And we, we really, I felt so proud of the helpers that came that helped not only with what was happening to find our, our, our rightful place within the new society that we're developing, but it also provided hope and empowerment for our people that were struggling with the challenges of living in Thunder Bay. And uh, it was really wonderful to see uh, the, the people that came and supported, even the agencies that brought food and trays and feasts. And it was just really a beautiful experience and was rich with spirit. And that really, really helped with getting us to where we are today, where we won both stage one and two of the litigation. It, it, it really helped create the right recipe to get us where we are today. That's so fascinating to me. Here I am thinking we're talking about treaty law and section 35 and, and, and there's a problem with municipal regulations potentially scarpering an act of sovereignty. That's, that's something that we need to pay attention to. There's some work that we need to do on that. Um, thank you. Can I, uh, should I open it up? Um, if there's any comments related to that from you, Chris or Mike? Um, the role of indigenous procedure? Or should we move on? I, I, I have things to say. I, I'll let Mike go first. Though. I just wanted to come back to, uh, you know, a little bit about uh, what uh, Chief Sayers uh, spoke about in terms of, uh, you know, Indigenous law. And uh, I wanted to say that through those, uh, th through those sessions of court in that 78, that first, 78 days of uh, court hearings, we had experts that were uh, brought to us by uh, some by the, uh, by the uh, communities themselves and some by our legal team 
they brought together into the court a host of information on what Indigenous law is, because the court did not know uh, much about Indigenous law at the time. So this is what really made this case unique in court, that the court uh, took into consideration the Indigenous laws. <clears throat> One of those is uh, we spoke about uh, the Powagan, the pipe, at the signing of the, um, the treaty in 1850, that the, the, the process of, uh, uh, of uh, smoking the pipe was something that the British Crown recognized as very important in uh, Indigenous law to solemnize a, an agreement. And so they made sure that when William Benjamin Johnson uh, uh, negotiated the treaty that the Powagan was going to be part of the process. And that's an, uh, an Indigenous law that says the creator and all of creation must be a part of uh, building a relationship between the parties, between the uh, Ojibwe people and the crown. And that's, that was used and was explained in the court. The other one was talking about wampum belts, uh, treaty belts that were, that were uh, negotiated over the years. The basis for treaties in, in Canada are based on uh, crown recognition of Indigenous law. And in doing that, the, the King of England in 1763 uh, issued the Royal Proclamation, which recognized the nationhood and the land ownership of the indigenous people of North America. And that's important because that's the, that's the uh, from that came the Treaty of Niagara in 1764. One year later, um, William Johnson, who was then the superintendent of uh, uh, um, First Nation Affairs in Canada uh, on behalf of the Crown uh, asked all of the uh, tribes of the uh, Indigenous people to come to Niagara to talk about what was in the Royal Proclamation, what the process would be to, uh, to, uh, to if, if the Crown uh, required more land, uh, those kinds of things. It's said in there that no one but the Crown could take land from Indigenous people, and it had to be done by treaty. And that's why in 1850, in 1848 actually is where it started, uh, Chief Shingwakons and Chief Nebenegoching from Bashwana said to the Crown, you cannot come into our territory and use our land without signing a treaty with us. That was the impetus for the Crown then to send William Benjamin Robinson to meet with the Ojibwe people to create the, uh, the, the, the treaty. And so all of that, that information, plus all of the other treaty belts were brought into the court and explained in the court by uh, one of our experts, uh, Alan Corbier from Chiging First Nation, explained the, the, the court, the, the, uh, the belt system to the, uh, to the court so that they could understand these are the ways, the laws that we use to establish um, our, you know, uh, a justice system in, in, in our world. As well, we had an elder from uh, Treaty 3, um, his name is Fred Kelly, and he spoke about um, indigenous law, uh, Anishinaabe law to the court. That was a, uh, a really interesting education for the court to, to, to listen to. And those are the kinds of things, and there was more as well, uh, two, uh, two of our, uh, of our experts, Dr. Dr. Heidi uh, Stark and Dr. Heidi Bauker were two of the experts that, uh, that spoke to the court about indigenous law and indigenous traditions. And, uh, you know, that they gave the Anishinaabe perspective 
hit to the court about our understanding of uh, of treaty making and and the and the treaty that was uh, signed in 1850 so all of that kind of thing put together is 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 uh, is uh, bringing forward the Anishinaabe perspective in the court and i think maybe chris might uh, might like to add something to that discussion as well <clears throat> if if there's time yeah, yeah. i can add a, a little bit yeah there is, and maybe we can um, combine that a little bit. So a question um, is about um, what is the, um, what's the precedent from this decision? What is the most important things that are coming out of it in your perspective being involved in the court? I think from the comments today, there's a Indigenous, the role of Indigenous law is incredibly significant. I'm also mm. curious about your experiences with that, but then also about um, any possibilities for uh, ramifications for other treaty matters around the country um, for a new. Mm. So, um, any thoughts on those two points would be very welcome. Yeah, I can I can speak to those as well, but I, I did want to yes, I'll speak to those. Um, there are a couple points that I wanted to make about the role of Anishinaabe law in the court proceedings though, and just from the perspective of, of me as, as a legal practitioner, as a lawyer, as counsel, um, is that, you know, as, as we we're hearing, you know, a sacred fire was lit throughout the entire, uh, has been lit throughout the entire trial, throughout the 78 days in stage one and the two weeks in stage two. Um, and, and there were several ceremonies, sweat lodge ceremonies that were conducted throughout where all um, parties were represented, including the court. And so the judge participated in those and, and also counsel from Canada, Ontario, from the Red Rock and White Sand First Nations um, and counsel from our, our team as well. Uh, so those were really integral to recognizing the nature of the work that is involved in these kinds of trials. And, and as a lawyer, I can tell you it it's requires a significant endurance. It's, it's a marathon, if not an ultra marathon. Um, in terms of the, the level of work and the, the productivity and performance. Um, but these are things, and, and what I wanted to do is to help situate this, is just read one passage from, from the stage one trial decision. And this is paragraph 214. And this is just to help to understand. Uh, the judge writes, the substantive treaty discussion started September 5th, 1850, following a pipe ceremony and possibly a smudging ceremony with all the delegates from Lake Superior and Huron gathered. As Mr. Morrison, who is the, our expert, Jim Morrison, um, pointed out, it is important to note that the treaty council took place around the Nishnabe council fire at Bao Ting, Sault Ste. Marie, and not at the King's council fire at Manitowaning, nor at the Legislative Assembly or Executive Council offices of the provincial government in Toronto, nor at the Royal Palace of the Monarch in London, England. Further, not only did the Treaty Council take place at a central and long-standing site of Nishnabe governance, it was conducted in Nishnabe Moan as well as English and incorporated ceremonies and protocols that characterize the long-standing system of Great Lakes diplomacy. The location of the Treaty Council as well as the protocols and procedures followed, indicate that the British, including Robertson, as a treaty commissioner, William Benjamin Robertson, had developed at least a functional understanding of the Nishnabe systems of law, diplomacy, and language. So that is a, one of the most important passages, I think, when we're, when we're talking about how Nishnabe law is integral, uh, not only to the court proceedings we're involved in today, but also integral to understanding a, you know, a proper understanding of the treaty. And, and we think of treaties today, perhaps as Canadians, as perhaps all of us, we see these documents and, and we just see this written text, um, which is supposed to be a record of what was agreed to. Uh, but we don't think about how a treaty is produced. We don't think about um, what a treaty is, what it, what it means. The written English text of the treaty suggests that it's just this conveyance, just the typical sort of British land transaction. Um, but it's far from that. And when you understand the historical context, you start to realize um, that the treaties were negotiated, treaties were made um, not under a British system of law in that sense, but under Nishnabe systems of law. The British 
were invited into this system. They were invited to Nishnabe council fires, which are those sites of governance, which operate under um, well-established for you know, hundreds, if not thousands of years, uh, protocols and systems by which uh, two nations or representatives of nations um, come together and, and discuss how they're going to share and coexist in a space. Um, and so when we think about precedent for treaty rights jurisprudence in Canada, this is really just one of many factors from the Rasool case that, that will, will have, we hope, have a longstanding impact, which is that just the fundamental understanding of treaties, not as land transactions. There are other passages in the judgment where, the, where Justice Hennessy says this was not a one-time transaction. Um, but treaties are, you know, relationships you know, the relationships between nations that are based on foundational principles of respect, reciprocity, renewal, um, and mutual responsibilities between them. Uh, you know, and relationships are not, treaties are not just relationships that just started in 1850, but rather in 1850, it was the renewal and restoration of a crown Anishinaabek relationship that dated back to at least 1750, if not much earlier, um, even based on the historical record of the British themselves, you know, Mike talked about the Royal Proclamation of 1763, and the Royal Proclamation of 1763 came at a time when, you know, this area uh, was under significant turmoil um, and pressures uh, from uh, conflict and, and so forth. The British had, had thought that they had conquered the French um, only with the help, though, of the Anishinaabeg, the Seven Nations Confederacy, the Six Nations Confederacy, you know, uh, who they were allied with, um, but they weren't respecting the or fully appreciating the nature of the military alliance that they had. And so uh, Chief Pontiac, Pontiac, Godawa Chief Pontiac, um, engaged in what was then called Pontiac War. And, and so there was a period of turmoil and, and, and war happening. Um, which led not only to the Royal Proclamation of 1763, which was a, which was a declaration from the king of, of you know, the British crown, um, but it was followed thereafter by the Treaty at Niagara in 1764, um, which is a really important aspect of this. Uh, Sir William Johnson knew that you can't just show a piece of paper called the Royal Proclamation and everybody just agrees to it or believes it even, believes what's said in there that the, you know, um, the said tribes who are, are under our protection and so forth, that we respect their autonomy and sovereignty and their rights to land. Um, and so the treaty at Niagara was necessary and it was conducted very similarly to how we're talking here or what the judge says in her passage at 214. It was conducted in accordance with that system of Great Lakes diplomacy uh, in order to ensure that, you know, the tribes there, the Indian nations um, agreed to the kind of offer, if you will, that was being put out there by the British Crown. And that's that's part of the relationship, the long-standing treaty relationship between the Anishinaabek and the Crown um, that is the lead up. So there's there's that part of the precedent. Um, there are other precedents that, that will come out of this case, I'm sure, uh, notably around, we hope, the honor of the Crown. Um, you know, one thing that is interesting is that in this case, we pled uh, that there was a breach of the honor of the crown, a breach of the crown's honorable obligations. And for those who, who are familiar with some of the jurisprudence in the Manitoba Métis Federation case, the court said that the honor of the crown is not a standalone cause of action. It's not a cause of action in, in itself, rather it speaks to how obligations that attract it must be fulfilled. Um, and so from a procedural side of things, from a substantive law side of things, it's, it's a question as to whether or not um, a court can find that there's been a breach of the honor of the crown. And if there has been a breach of the honor of the crown, then, then what are the remedies for a uh, breach of the honor of the crown? So these are sort of novel issues that will arise and are, are being dealt with. Um, some other precedents around the honor of the crown as a doctrine itself uh, arise in a unique way from this case because um, the honor of the crown itself as, as a doctrine in it insofar as it relates to Aboriginal law um, was first talked about in an 1895 decision of the Supreme Court of Canada 
uh, between Canada and Ontario. It's called referred to as the Indian annuities case often. And it deals with the very same treaty, the Robinson treaties and the very same provision, the augmentation clause. Um, and so the, it was the dissenting reasons of Justice Gwynn on the Supreme Court of Canada who said, and I had the quote here, I'll try to pull it up, who said, quote, and further that the terms and conditions expressed in those instruments, he's referring to the treaties, as to be performed by or on behalf of the Crown, have always been regarded as involving a trust graciously assumed by the Crown to the fulfillment of which the Indians, the faith and honor of the Crown is pledged and which trust has always been most faithfully fulfilled as a treaty obligation of the Crown." End quote. And so Justice Gwynne is saying this in 1895, and he was in the dissent by quite a, a long margin. Um, the majority were of the view that, that the treaty was essentially a transaction. Um, there, the debate was essentially around whether or not Section 109 of the Constitution Act 1867, or what's now known as the Constitution Act 1867, whether the words in their interest or trust, um, whether the annuities or the obligation to pay increased annuities uh, were incorporated or, or, or formed part of Section 109. And, and I guess for those listening, the, the ramifications of, of finding that the obligation to pay annuities was an interest or trust that burdened the beneficial interest of the land received by the province of Ontario. And so if you can think about it, if, if there's an obligation on the Crown to pay increased annuities that burdens their beneficial interest, which the province receives under Section 109, then, then there's a very different way of looking at the land, so to speak. Um, and so, so the majority said that it couldn't have been that there was this burden on there. Um, they, they go that way. And, and the same thing happened to when this was taken to the Privy Council in London. And then just to quote just briefly from the Privy Council decision, they said it couldn't have been the intention of either the treaty or section 109 to impose a trust on the beneficial interest of the lands held by Ontario because it would be quote, a considerable inconvenience to the government of the province. End quote. And they go on to say, quote, why in these circumstances a liberal construction should be resorted to for the purpose of raising an equitable right in the Indians, the so-called equity appears to have been conjured up for the doubtful purpose of construing the provisions of Section 109 with an amount of liberality which the ordinary canons of construction do not admit of, end quote. Um, and so this is 1895, 1896. And when they're talking about liberality, liberal principles of construction and equity and equitable rights, they're casting doubt on what Justice Gwynne was saying, essentially, which is that, you know, the honor of the crown has always been pledged, that these agreements are more than just transactions, that they give rise um, to treaty obligations that should be enforceable, justiciable, reviewable, all of these things. And, and now the existing treaty jurisprudence under, you know, the Supreme Court of Canada's 1999 decision in Marshall, um, which adopted Justice Gwynne's uh, dissenting reasons, there and which have always been adopted in, in subsequent decisions, Haida Nation, Manitoba Métis Federation, these other ones, um, Little Salmon. We can see treaty jurisprudence evolving in that sense, consistent with how Justice Gwynne saw it. And so when we're reaching that point of understanding that treaties are relationships, treaties impose treaty obligations on the Crown that have to be reviewed and enforced, um, and treaties are these things that can, in some cases, impose trusts or, as we know them, fiduciary obligations. Um, these are things that will create tension within the jurisprudence, at least, because half of it is still stuck in the past, in the, the thinking of the Privy Council, which is that it's just a considerable inconvenience to burden the government with these obligations. We see this we see this coming up in how the duties to consult and accommodate are, are thought of. We see this coming up in, in cases that involve um, direct what? assertions of jurisdiction on the ground by land defenders. 
and mining companies, forestry companies, they go into court and say, look, we've got this permit from the provincial government saying we can cut timber, we can start mining here, and, and we're being stopped by, you know, land defenders on the ground who are saying you're destroying sacred areas, you're, you're destroying places that um, we've been harvesting for hundreds of thousands of years, you know, um, and so then the court grants injunctions against land defenders um, in favor of companies because they've got this permit, right? And so we see these tensions in all over the place um, in all sorts of ways in the, in the jurisprudence. And, and as the honor of the crown is, is advanced, as some of these treaty rights uh, cases, um, as the jurisprudence evolves, that is the kind of precedent, I think, that has the potential to flow from this case and, and to really force the court and, and governments themselves to reflect on on the positions uh, they've they've taken, and the viewpoints that they've held, and how how they start to contradict themselves. Um, Thank you. Thank you. That's so interesting. I think that's something that's coming through in, in, in uh, the comments from all three of you, of our panelists, is around um, legal fiction, certainly, for interpretation of yeah. the treaties, but a real legal fiction around the time component, right? A desire to pretend that prior agreements and understanding didn't exist. Um, and that's just a really interesting temporal component that we need to continue working on. We have um, um, time for one last question, which I'm gonna direct um, at you, uh, Mike. Um, and then there are a few questions coming in um, in the chat, which hopefully we can have take a moment to address at the end before we um, close out our panel. Um, Mike, we've heard about the different uh, stages for the restore decision. Um, they're in various degrees of hearings and appeals. Um, the third stage concerning calculation of annuity payments and damages has not yet been heard. So that's what um, uh, uh, council are currently preparing for. Um, it would be helpful to hear about how this litigation might be resolved through settlement. If the cases were settled, what would be the impact both for treaty uh, beneficiaries and for non-Indigenous communities on Robinson Superior and here on treaty land writ large? Yes, well, if we, if we are able to settle out of court, it would be an agreement of the parties, which would probably be the best uh, the best way to, to settle the case. However, we are still marching toward settlement in the courts. And if it's settled in the courts, that, uh, that uh, whatever amount is, is uh, determined to be uh, owing to the First Nations is going to be uh, expended in their territories. For example, here at Nipissing, most of our uh, purchases from, uh, from people and from, the, uh, from our local government here in Nipissing are spent in Sturgeon Falls, the town of Sturgeon Falls and the town of uh, or the city of North Bay. So they benefit from the economy that is existing currently in the First Nation, albeit we are not a very uh, wealthy, uh, we're not very wealthy people, but uh, you know, that's, that's what's, what happens in, in our territory. And if there's an increase in, in, uh, in uh, the economy in Nipissing First Nation, the obvious benefic benefactors from, from that would be the city of North Bay and Sturgeon Falls, you know, and the people that run those businesses there that uh, you know, we will be going to those restaurants, we'll be going to those builders supply uh, places and uh, grocery stores and every other thing, you know, and, and that's, that will be increased if there is an, a, a, a buildup of the economy at the first station as a result of uh, settlement of this case. So as I've said before, we're not gonna go to the moon to spend this money. We're going to spend it exactly where we always spend the money, right in the area of Nipissing First Nation, where that's that's how the, the the economy will benefit from this. So it will be a share of the resource development in our territory, 
and uh, that will go to benefit the First Nations and also the surrounding uh, non-native communities. Thank you. Thank you. So a real um, a sense of uh, this point uh, that we are all treaty peoples in action, right? Uh, impacting local communities. Um, perhaps I can open it up to um, any last comments in response to that question um, from either uh, Chris or you, Chief uh, the sales concerning potential settlement? Yeah, I think, um, thank you for that, Daniel. Um, Mike sums, sums it up very well. Um, the, the settlement um, will help with providing that, I guess, stimulation to the economy, but it also uh, represents the seriousness of the violation. I think there was and should have been an enforcement of the promise all the way through. And even today, um, there seems to be a reluctance on the complete embracing of the spirit and the intent of the implementation, not only on the annuities, but a number of other fronts. So when the, what we believe to be the decision uh, comes out in regards to um, the annuities, uh, we're really optimistic that it'll be aligned with our historic expectations that that will really show the governments that the, um, the, how we deal with the promises in the future has to shift. It has to uh, be more reflective of the other side and perspective that um, that we should be seeing the treaty from. So I think it's really uh, a good exercise we're going through here. It brings to light um, many of the atrocities, many of the issues that I think Canadians want to see dealt with in another way. So I think settlement um, also um, implementation is just as big of a, of a factor from, from my perspective. I, I, I don't have much to say about settlement um, okay. or I won't, I won't say anything about settlement for myself. I, my focus has been on litigating right now. So, but I would be happy. I would be very happy if this settled, absolutely. Perfect. Thank you for your thoughtful comments. That was so, I, every time I hear about the case, I learn new things that I didn't know. So that insight was so appreciated. Um, insights, plural. And we have a question, a series of questions from Robert coming in. So um, maybe we can just underscore some of the comments there, some of our discussion. So the question from Robert's, um, Robert is around uh, um, the common intention behind the treaty text, uh, um, thinking about uh, um, the validity of a treaty text when it only um, uh, incorporates one perspective in its written um, documentation. Um, he asks, if the treaty text is invalid on this basis, how do we proceed to establish uh, um, common intention? Um, is actually ceremony essential to establishing common intention? So I'll open that up to um, the panel, um, to whomever would like to take that question. I I can I can start. Um, the treaty text, it doesn't mean that the treaty text is invalid, uh, but it just means it's not the whole story. It's not the entire representation of the common intention. It can't be. It's written in English. Um, it's written in a foreign language, uh, foreign at least to the Anishinaabeg. Um, and, and so we can't take that as sort of gospel, if you will. Uh, normally legal documents that are, you know, stamped and all these kinds of things. Uh, and there is a question as to whether or not the treaty was a sealed document. Um, but, you know, when we're talking about a common intention, we're talking about two perspectives. We're talking about Anishinaabe perspectives and the Crown's perspective of what their uh, respective intentions were uh, in the treaty. And so if we think about that, then the treaty text is really just one part of the story. It's one piece of evidence, uh, if you will, um, that suggests what what the common intention with the treaty was. And so that is why you can't, it's not a question of whether it's valid or invalid, it's just, it's a question of, it only represents 
part of the story. And with respect to ceremony, as, as we see in the judgment, as we've heard from, from Gima Sayers and, and, and Mike Stuhl here, is that ceremony is, is an integral part of how treaties are, are negotiated, how treaties are recognized and affirming the responsibilities that are undertaken um, before creation. Right, ceremonies are integral to ensuring that that those promises are made uh, witnessed by creation. Um, and and like Gimese was saying, the the trees, the plants, the waters, the animals, they are witnessing uh, the promises being made and undertaken because they are all part of the existing web of relationships that stand to be impacted and affected by. Uh, whether or not those promises are fulfilled or not. And so, so that's part of how, how those things are integral to understanding common intention and, and the treaty itself. Well said, uh, Chris. Um, yeah, the, we, we have always understood from our oral tradition, the the perspective that was shared by our historic ancestral leadership. And we've never lost sight of that. And I think there are some contradictions, but I think there is a foundation that we could probably utilize our lens uh, to look through, to see within even the text that we see in the courtrooms as at least uh, providing uh, a window into that relationship that was struck and how we look at it today um, has a lot of relevance. And as was noted um, in the uh, in Justice Hennessy uh, comments, um, um, our oral understanding of the, the relationship is, is a force and um, is really uh, also just as important. So um, we expect this living document to continue to further evolve and um, there will be further evolution in the very near future on a number of fronts in that regard. And of course, ceremony is and always will be, has and always will be a really important part of how we govern, and, um, how spirit is incorporated in everything that we do. And that's what our elders and our, our cultural people continually insist that we do. Thank you. I think that's a wonderful note to, to lead, leave on, the most important note, actually. I want to say thank you uh, to Chief uh, um, Sayers. Thank you to Elder Mike. Thank you to Chris for joining us. Thank you for the informative discussion and for your participation for everyone at home. Um, we appreciate, I appreciate the time that our panelists have uh, given us today um, to join us. Um, please join us tomorrow with Brian Charles as he speaks about the wampum belts woven through Anishinaabe history and our Treaties Recognition Week closing ceremony. Thank you again. I feel very strongly that us in the Lakehead community have an obligation to learn and know about our treaties and our treaty lands. So thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. Miigwech. Have a, have a great day. Miigwech. Miigwech. Bomb up, Bomb up,